Welcome back. You are taking a look now at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, where in just a few minutes, a SpaceX Crew Dragon capsule will launch into space. A team of four astronauts are getting ready to head there on what will be a historic mission on several fronts. They'll be making their way to the International Space Station, and one of those astronauts, Nicole Mann, will make history as the first Native American woman ever to go to space and the first woman to ever serve as commander on a SpaceX mission. I want to bring in former NASA astronaut Katie Coleman live now, along with astrophysicist Hakeem Alusei for more on this. Uh, Katie, what are these astronauts feeling right now in that capsule ready to go? And I was just, uh, just thinking back to my days, my very first launch. I mean, they are so excited. And at the same time, they are focused. There's actually just a lot to do to monitor keep your head in the game notice small details so they're very focused and yet when that rocket lights i mean it's just really it's going to be amazing now, hakeem we have seen a few potential launches aborted recently what are the conditions what conditions do you need for a launch like this yeah so every large rocket that goes up NASA has a detailed checklist of criteria that must be met, right? And many of them have to do with the weather. There's limits on cloud cover, the heights of the cloud, how close the clouds are to the launch pad. There's issues with crosswind, the wind velocity cannot be too high. Then there's precipitation and lightning, right? You don't want to launch in a hailstorm. So pretty much safety first is, is the rule always. And so if you are trying to launch in inclement weather, or a danger of inclement weather, then the launch is going to be scrubbed and put off to another day. Now, Katie, uh, there's a, a varied crew on board here. You've had NASA astronaut Nicole Mann. She's the commander on board this mission. NASA astronaut Joss Casada. We also have a Japanese astronaut on board, a Russian wow. cosmonaut on board. How important, Katie, is it to have this be this, this collective experience? It's not just SpaceX. It's not just NASA. It's not even just the U.S. You know, it's just part of normal life in uh, operating a, a space station these days. There's 15 partners and, you know, we need to do all these things together so that we each understand each other's operations. So it's critical that Anya Kikana is with us um, on this trip. Um, Koichi Wakata and I started at NASA on the very first, very same day um, many years ago. He is the experienced person on this crew um, and brings, you know, a wealth of knowledge of living up on the space station as well as shuttle missions. And, and so there's just um, having all of them together, it's just the way space is supposed to be. And not to mention, we actually can't operate that space station, any of us countries alone. And, and Hakeem, I want to talk about the maintenance of that space yeah. station, because that's part of this mission. They're going right. to be conducting spacewalks to do some work on the exterior of the International Space Station. They're also conducting something like 200 different experiments while they're out there. Yeah. How important is this work to the world? Well, if we are going to go in deeper into space, keep people in space longer, then we're going to have to understand the health effects on of people being in space. So a lot of what's happening now is based on making measurements of the environment and also how to grow food in space, right? So you don't have soil, you'll be far away from Earth. Um, and so it's not as easy as doing it here. So typically, if you look at experiments that are done in space, quite often there are things far removed from biology, right? There's material science experiments. There's experiments um, that have to do with manufacturing in zero gravity. But now we're focused on getting humans in space long term and far away from Earth to the moon, to Mars and perhaps beyond. So we really have to characterize um, exactly what happens to people. And also it's not just important to mitigate the dangers and the hazards, you also need to assess the humans in real time. And one of those humans in real time, Katie, is Nicole Mann. She's said to be the first Native American woman to go into space. She's also the first woman to ever command a SpaceX mission. What can you tell us about her? Nicole is just simply awesome. She's an F-18 pilot. I mean, she's got so much aviation experience. She's a U.S. Marine. Um, and at the same time, I mean, Nicole is a mom. She's got a family. 
and and she's a person that is really i think uh, uniquely willing to share the challenges that she's had just because i think it's important to nicole that the young people realize that sitting on top of this rocket doesn't just happen it comes with hard work it comes from asking for help it comes from learning to use resources doing your best in school all those things um she's uh she's just the best and you know, we haven't had a woman commander um, of, a, of a small spacecraft like this in a long time, you know, the, with the shuttle, you know, Eileen Cam Collins, Pam Melroy, now our deputy administrator. And so uh, Susan still was a pilot on the shuttle, but now uh, having uh, Nicole Mann be the commander and walk out in that position and be the voice you hear on the radio, it's it means everything to me. And Nicole also did speak about the fact that there will be a Russian cosmonaut, Anna Kakina, on board the rocket today. And she talked about that partnership. I, I want to get your reaction to that. Let's listen to that for a second. You know, uh, I can't ignore what's going on in the world, and there's always a lot going on in the world, right? But the crew of the International Space Station has a unique responsibility to really come together, collaborate, and work as a team, no matter where you come from or what's going on in the world. It's vital to the success of our mission that we work together as a team. As you mentioned, you learn to rely and trust each other, and that's a big part of the mission. So, Katie, how does a relationship like that between the Russians and American astronauts and cosmonauts, how does that relationship endure even as these two nations are at odds over the war in Ukraine? Well, I don't think it surprises anyone um, like myself who's who's been part of the space program and not just the crew. You know, making these mission happen, missions happen is making connections at every level of each space agency between people and keeping focused on the mission I think is what does it. And exploring space, being safe in space, using space to understand life on Earth here. So many of the experiments that uh, Hakim described are, you know, we, 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 look, we look great and fun up there. And at the same time, it actually is a little bit of an aging, a sort of fast aging environment. Our hearts act like aging hearts. You know, our bodies do interesting biological kinds of changes. And those, those results actually come right back down here to Earth. And so the fact that all of us are involved in something that means so much, not just to our countries, but to the whole planet, that is what brings us together and you know it follows on to things like climate change to understanding asteroids that might hit the earth I mean these are all global issues and it is crews one on one to one getting together that are going to help us solve them and hey, Katie we're about uh, just under two minutes now to launch what can we expect to see as this rocket prepares for launch and then takes off well, we, uh, I think if we were there, we'd see actually a lot of people crying, believe it or not. I mean, it's a really emotional experience to see a launch. I mean, when this happens, it's so amazingly powerful. And if you're lucky enough to be there in Florida, you can actually feel that vibration. You can feel that launch and that thrust coming through your chest if you're watching a few miles away. And, you know, I mean, all these satellites that we launch are important to life here on Earth. But when there's people on board, it is special. And I find myself just completely riveted. You just can't look away. And just so excited to see them go into space. Want them to be safe. All right, and they're getting ready for the countdown now. Let's listen in. We should get the final go for launch from SpaceX launch director Mark Sirtis. SpaceX, Godspeed, go for launch. SpaceX Dragon, go for launch. SpaceX reports go, seconds. crew reports go, 30 seconds until liftoff. T minus 15. 10. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Ignition. Engines full power. And let's go.
plus 35 seconds into the fifth rotational crew mission on board Dragon and Falcon 9. Coming up in just a few seconds, we'll hear the call out for stage one throttle down. Stage one throttle down. Falcon 9 engines throttling down to help pass through the period of maximum dynamic pressure. This period is known as max Q, and what's the vehicle? There we just heard that the vehicle's now traveling faster than the speed of sound. Once through max Q, we'll throttle those Merlin engines back up. Stage one throttle up. Stage one Bravo. Copy one Bravo. That call out for one Bravo means we're in the second and final abort mode for the first stage, continuing to get good performance. The crew is already pulling over two G's. And next up is going to be a couple of events in rapid succession. First will be engine chill on the second stage and back engine. And there you heard that call out. And then we'll have Miko or main engine cutoff where the nine engines igniting will cut off in preparation for second stage separation. Then we'll see the single Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage ignite and continue to carry the crew five astronauts to orbit. Just like we did on first stage, that MVAC chill is intended to help pre-chill the hardware prior to the full flow of that densified liquid oxygen. Stage one throttle down. At this point in time, those nine Merlin engines are beginning to throttle down in preparation for MECO or main engine cutoff. Standing by for MECO. And Miko. Stage two alpha. And Stage separation confirmed. Copy two alpha. There we should see that second engine begin to ignite now. And obviously confirmed by the loud cheer behind us here at Mission Control Hawthorne. And we're also in two alpha for the aborts if needed. Again, second stage is lit and continuing to carry the crew five astronauts into orbit. We're now getting a view of the first stage uh, after that stage separation. The second stage is still being illuminated by that single Merlin vacuum engine and that's on the right hand side of your screen. First stage on the left hand side of your screen making its way back to Earth. We will be attempting to land it on our drone ship, um, which today we're using just read the instructions. Acquisition signal, Bermuda. And we did hear that acquisition of the ground station in Bermuda. The first stage is continuing to make its way back to Earth, and the second stage is going Dragon, to continue. SpaceX, trajectory nominal. Another good call, trajectory nominal. Dragon copy. Confirmation there from Commander Nicole Mann. You can also sort of see the, the Space Coast there in the background of the first stage on the left-hand side of your screen. It also looks like you can actually see the thrust plume uh, created by the first stage as it's now rotating just out of screen. Second stage is going to continue firing until a little over eight minutes into the flight, really doing the heavy lifting now, getting the crew into orbit. Everything continues to look nominal on both first and second stages. As I mentioned before, the first stage... And we've just watched uh, that NASA and SpaceX launch. The Crew-5 is now headed to the International Space Station after a successful launch. And what we just saw was the Crew Dragon spacecraft actually separated from that SpaceX rocket. So what you're seeing on the left is the SpaceX rocket that gets it up in that initial launch. That rocket is now headed back to Earth where SpaceX is uh, going to try to and hopefully successfully land it again. On the right-hand side, you're seeing the Crew Dragon spacecraft that is now carrying the crew to the International Space Station where they're hoping to dock on Thursday around 5 p.m. Eastern Time. And former NASA astronaut Katie Coleman joins me live now along with astrophysicist Hakeem Alusayi for a more on all of this. So, 
I mean, Katie, just talk me through the emotions you're feeling right now. You've been in this position. You have gone to space. You have gone to the International Space Station. What are you feeling right now? You know, all those things, and when it really happens, I could barely breathe, Diane. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> such a, I mean, it's literally such a big deal to leave the planet. It takes so many things going right, everybody doing their best on the team. You trust the team to have done that. And, and knowing that it's, that it's happening, I mean, we trust our partners, we all trust, and yet this is a hard thing. And when there's people on board, you just want everything to be right. So far, so good. I, I look at all the milestones, that main engine cut off, that first stage SEP, um, and now we're in the middle of the second uh, second engine, second stage firing and everything looking good. You'll hear some boring words like nominal trajectory. And that's exactly what you want to hear, you know, if you are the family of those astronauts and the people who have been training them, getting them ready. And, uh, and then I, I love seeing our planet in back of that rocket plume because all of us are back there. I mean, I think uh, the Crew-5 astronauts are just realizing that home is bigger than they thought. Uh, Akeem, I see you shaking your head, uh, or, no, or rather nodding uh, in agreement, I should say. What goes through your head when you see something like this, particularly as an astrophysicist, when you think of all the advances in science and all the pieces that had to come together to make something like this possible today? Yes, I am really just, I get chills every time. Like the first thing is, you know, I have actually built instruments to send into space and, you know, the technology, the know-how, the time, the work, the effort that goes into the engineering of a craft like this. And then as an astronaut to climb on top of this big, giant, powerful machine. And like Katie said, right, you have to trust that this thing is gonna work. Now, today we know what it looks like when it goes wrong. So, so fail safes have been put in these abort measures that they have to keep the astronauts safe but i tell you it really takes courage to climb in on top of one of these things and get out there right i mean i've never done it but i would love to do it but again i would question my own sanity because <laughs> it is a very powerful and complex machine they are on top of. And the fact that we can just even do this, and it appears to be so routine, it just lets me know, you know, we were once a, a primate in the, in the forest, and now we can do this. Yeah, it Unbelievable. Is it is amazing. Katie, you want to defend your sanity there? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't think I have to, and that everybody's got their own method of sanity. And, and I heard something in Hakeem's voice, and I am, he would be on that rocket. You heard it. And, yeah. you know, the fact that we're working with commercial companies and that space is becoming more accessible, more people going, you know, each of us bringing our individuality, which really counts because the problems that we're solving to get there and what we do there are really hard. And so uh, I, I love that so many more people are going, but that doesn't, it's never going to be safe. It's always going to be a big deal. And I love watching. I love going too. And Hakeem, I want to talk about some of the, the science that's happening there. You know, I mentioned yeah. before they're performing more than 200 experiments. Wow. They include things like printing human organs in space, understanding fuel systems operating on the moon, better understanding heart disease. They may be in space, but they are using that time to try to solve problems that we have here at home right now. Yes, they are. And the problems that we're going to have as more and more people venture out into space. Like, you know, if you look at the studies of what happens to the human body when you have a prolonged time period in space, virtually every physical system is affected. Your skeleton, your bones lose mass, your muscles lose mass, your circul circulation changes, there's changes to your brain changes to your vision your immune system changes so if we're going to really fulfill our dream and our vision then we need to know how to mitigate each of these and we need to know how to deal with our minds and our bodies right you're in an isolated confined system for extended periods of time you have to produce food and water and fuel you know it's a lot to it so 200 experiments is really a small number for um, getting through everything that needs to be done but NASA is so good at piecewise going at things one by one and knocking them down. And I gotta say, you know, the way America is built, this system of innovation where the government funds basic research at the universities, then that turns into corporations. And you have now commercial partners that are doing this. You don't require a nation state to do it. I mean, you know, this is really remarkable. Uh, speaking of remarkable, while you were talking, we just saw what I think was a SpaceX rocket land successfully to a round of applause. I know it's not the first time they've done it, 
But it kind of blows my mind every time it happened. What, what do you think as an astrophysicist watching them land a rocket? Yeah, again, this is something that is absolutely amazing. I've not seen that in real life myself. I've seen lots and lots of launches, but I've never seen one of these boosters land. And, you know, when they first started presenting this idea of reusable rockets, I thought, okay, this is going to take a while. That's a really hard thing to do, but they've achieved it. And the fact that you are able to, to land so precisely and so safely and do it over and over again. You know, you talked a lot about how this is an international um, mission. Well, you know, humans are so dope. If we set our minds to something, we can get it done. And if we all work together as a planet, as one giant human family, I always say we'd be Star Trek tomorrow. <laughs> Star Trek tomorrow, I love it. Uh, Katie, they're hoping to dock at the space station at 5 p.m. Eastern time on Thursday. Uh, there are seven astronauts already there at the ISS, and there'll be a little bit, we're looking at the command center now, um, there'll be a little bit of a handoff at the space station before four of the astronauts that are there already then return home. What happens when you're in that sort of handoff period? What are you learning to do? And what, are, what do they have to learn to do to then stay at the space station for the next, you know, five months as planned? So literally everything that they're going to hear in some ways, you've already been taught about it. But this is where, you know, literally, you know, you can like you walk into, I don't know, a rental house that you're going to stay in. And it's got a list of instructions. You know how to follow them and everything, you know, turn on the lights and the batteries are here and there's the generator. But when someone just takes you by the hand and you fly through the space station, they go, OK, this thing here, procedure, 12 pages long. Remember, all you're doing is ejecting that memory stick and putting in the new one. I mean, some of the tasks are not hard, but, you know, they're sort of translating what it really feels like. You know, some of the things that we record these things, too. So there's there's videos of these conversations so that, you know, we're building the things that they teach them into our procedures. But it's going to really make a giant shortcut. It's going to save them probably a third of their time to have this crew run around and make that space station now where everything is floating and flying real to them, especially because we've got three rookies on board. And Hakeem, you talked about the impacts on the human body. That's just one of many barriers to traveling to space. But there has been a lot of talk of space tourism. We have seen some civilians already go up into space. Do you think this is something that will become more and more common and more and more accessible? That does appear to be the trajectory, um, you know, but again, this is wait and see. This is a wait and see. Uh, we, we do have the private companies doing low um, sounding rocket experiments, right? They're not going into orbit. They're just doing sounding rockets. What SpaceX is doing here going to low Earth orbit is a bit beyond, right? And so it would, of course, be more expensive and there's more to it. And eventually going to the moon, you know, hopefully, you know, there are companies that are looking at just sending people for a trip around the moon. You don't land on the moon, but it is real. People are really working on it. And so, you know, if there's money to be made, someone will be doing it. <laughs> All right. That seems to be the driving force, uh, along with exploration and a, a lot of other great motivations. Hakeem, Katie, always great to have you both. Thank, Thank you. you. And I want to take one Thank more look so at that launch. Again, we just saw uh, SpaceX and NASA team up launching the Crew Dragon spacecraft, which is now on its way to the International Space Station. We'll be right back with some of the day's other top stories, so do stick around, but first let's take one more look at that launch. Four, three, two, one, Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.